Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Glad Sapursky. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today I'm joined by Marco. Marco, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and share about what you do? Yeah, my name is Marco Zappacosta, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Thumbtack. And Thumbtack is a technology company helping millions of people confidently care and care for and improve their homes. Um, you know, people turn to us for really everything, those small fixes, routine maintenance, major improvements. And um, we transitioned to a virtual first model in, uh, in 2021. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, you recently did a survey about showing some interesting results about virtual work. So tell me a little bit more about the survey. What did you find and why do you think the results are valuable? Yeah, so we did the survey in part to sort of <clears throat> check our own point of view, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the narrative today is one where, you know, senior leaders are pushing this return to office because they're saying they're sort of not performing as well or the mm -hmm. people want it, et cetera. And it's effectively the opposite of what we've experienced where, mm -hmm. you know, remote work has made us more productive. It's given people more job satisfaction. And ultimately that was something that, you know, we were curious, like we're the only ones. And, you know, the interesting thing was very much no. And in some sense, uh, in contrast to the narrative that's out there, um, most people said, you know, 75% of folks, uh, both leaders, you know, VPs and above and employees mm. that it made them more productive. Mm. Um, and that's something we see uh, strongly in our own data and mm -hmm. uh, what motivate us to really invest in sort of our virtual first model um, and something that sort of clearly others see as well. Excellent. Now, why do you believe that the leaders are pursuing RTO mandates, given that so many leaders from your own survey are reporting that, hey, people are more productive? So what motivates leaders to then do RTO? I think it's a couple of things. One is <clears throat> it's a sunk cost fallacy, uh, both mm -hmm. in the capital expense of the real estate and saying, hey, mm -hmm. we got to use this. We have this crazy lease obligation. But I think even more fundamentally, it's on how the most senior leaders who tend to be the most experienced people and sort of the oldest mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. have always worked. And mm -hmm. they are hesitant to operate in a new environment, given the stakes of their roles and the fact that they're trying to do their best work, which for them has always come in an office. So I get it. I think it's natural, but I think it is suboptimal. And mm -hmm. specifically, it pits this debate as being, is it remote or is it in office? And mm -hmm. that to me is a false choice where it's mm -hmm. much more about how can we get the best of both to make the company as a whole maximally effective and performant and efficient, et cetera. And it's not either or, it's both in the right combination, I would say. Yeah, what you're saying really resonates with me. I helped over two dozen companies figure out their flexible work policy, including return to office. And I remember this one company, a professional service firm of just about 150 people, where the CEO, who was really senior, he, during the pandemic, he was the only one who came to the office every day. And that was safe because nobody else came to the office. So he was the only one, literally, who came to the office every day. And he just had a lot of trouble imagining. Like, And then after the pandemic, he was really beating the drum around returning to the office because he could hardly imagine how people got any work done at home because it was hard for him to do work at home. He really needed that work-life separation. And that's why he came to the office every day. So what do you think... Uh, is happening with the CEOs that they're ordering employees back to the office, what should they be thinking about when having those mandates? What should be their motivations? Like what should be the approach? Yeah, <clears throat> look, I, I think there's never a one size fits all answer and it certainly mm -hmm. depends on scale of the business. So we're a thousand people now. And so my answers are tuned for companies of a certain scale. And mm -hmm. what I would say at our scale, the realities are you're never getting a thousand people into one space, even in mm -hmm. person very often. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of sort of subtle mixing, but as soon as you're at that scale, you likely have multiple offices in multiple cities. 
even within one city, you may be a spread across multiple buildings. There's sort of the HQ and the satellite. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you've already, in some sense, created silos. And so the question I would put back to people is like, how do you intentionally bring people together and ensure both culture and cohesion at the company level in aggregate, as well as sort of the team level? Um, and I think a virtual first environment enables leaders to be much more deliberate about that, saying, okay, mm. I do want that. It is critical to bring teams together, to build cohesion, to sort of discuss the deep hard issues which are hard to do in a virtual context when and how do i want to do that throughout the year as opposed to saying oh that'll just happen naturally um in the office and it's sort of one of my views is that remote work and virtual work rewards being explicit yeah. it rewards saying intentionality it doesn't necessarily require different things it's not like before you were not looking for cohesion and now you are, it's like, you've always mm -hmm. wanted it, but to do that in a virtual context requires being very deliberate. And mm -hmm. I'd argue the act of being deliberate forces uh, thinking, design, intentionality that typically creates a better answer and can create a better answer than just sort of the ad hoc ephemeral, well, it happens in the hall hallways, mm -hmm. we'll know it when we see it, or you know, we get it for free because we buy lunch for everybody. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I think you can do better is would be my push to these senior leaders. I like that. Uh, when I work with companies to figure out their flexible work policies, one of the things I do is create a clarity canvas, make sure that each team and department creates a clarity canvas. By that, I mean having very clear descriptions of structures, policies, procedures, and roles within a department and within a team, kind of how they do things, and having a digital hub where they keep all of their documentation, where they keep all of the information about all the projects, where they have clear structures around all yeah. of that. So those are very important things and they very much resonate with me about being deliberate. And so that I'm curious what you've seen as some of the challenges of that virtual first model. What, what have challenges have you seen and how have yeah. you solved them? Let's talk about the challenges first. What have you seen? And then we'll talk about yeah. solving them. Yeah, I, I, I will go there, but I, I want to stress a point where the things you describe being deliberate about are sort of knowledge process. <clears throat> I think you can go further and mm -hmm. think about the sort of core tenets of performance management, mm -hmm. goal setting, roles and responsibility, mm -hmm. expectations around performance and what is meeting the bar versus not meeting the bar. I think remote and virtual work rewards doing that very explicitly mm -hmm. and deliberately in some sense more than companies are used to because mm -hmm. these folks are scattered. And I think in that act, you get to a way better outcome on these things that all companies are doing, right? Or should be doing performance mm -hmm. management, you know, setting roles and responsibilities. So mm -hmm. it's been a really, really powerful push. In terms of the challenges, you know, I call out um, uh, two. And they're sort of similar, but it's really around this cohesion mm -hmm. and um, sort of shared affinity. I think it is very hard for teams to, to totally glue having only interacted virtually. One-on-one, mm -hmm. -on -one, you know, if you and I spend enough time on the phone or on Zoom, we could develop a very close relationship that's very productive and very effective. Absolutely. I'm sure you've collaborated with researchers all around the world and one-on-one, -on -one, very effective. As a group dynamic, though, because of the, I think, uh, higher latency of these conversations, mm -hmm. it forces a much more disciplined, single-threaded virtual conversation, which is very efficient, but deprives the room of the small talk of me and mm -hmm. you before the meeting, you know, talking mm -hmm. or, or me picking up on the conversation that you happen to have with your neighbor and chiming in and say, oh, did you hear about this other thing, right? Like mm -hmm. that crosstalk doesn't happen nearly yeah. as naturally. And so teams don't glue nearly as well in a virtual context as they do in person. You have to get them together to sort of accomplish that. And the other big challenge I'd say is onboarding. Mm -hmm. um, when somebody's sort of off track or lost or confused in person, it's easy to spot and say, hey, look, you know, that person needs help. Or hey, we should you know give them more uh, support because it seems like they they don't have they don't know their way around here quite yet. It's harder to catch that in a remote context, and so mm -hmm. you tend to have I think 
more unfortunate situations where an employee leaves after mm-hmm. a few months just because they, they didn't get the support and, and, and as opposed to in person where you would have seen it and helped it much sooner. So it, it's really yeah. around cohesion and we're social animals. So it's no surprise mm-hmm. that we lose that in a virtual context. But the upshot, you know, the efficiency, the equity in the experience, um, and ultimately the access to talent way offsets that. Yeah, and I think especially the onboarding, that's more fixable than the team cohesion. Just team cohesion to build up trust that's really valuable to be in person. I've for the onboarding, I've worked with a lot of clients where we did things like having very structured mentoring programs where you get a mentor from your own team and a mentor from outside your team. Mentor from your own team to tell you, here are the team dynamics in the team, here's how you actually do your job, all of that stuff. The mentor from outside your team to help you build those cross team connections, which would happen naturally if you're in the office and you meet people. But that mentor from outside your team helps you introduce you to people you need to know, mm-hmm. also helps you develop pro- a career inside the firm to know what other parts of the firm are like and to help you with organizational culture, what that's like. So having those structured team interactions with mentors, so within the team and outside your team with the mentoring interactions, with very clear guidelines for what mentors should be doing, how they should be interacting with the mentee, professional development for the mentor and the mentee, that has really been helpful. So that, I'm curious, so that, that's something that I found really helpful for the onboarding within the clients I work with. What have you found helpful to address the onboarding challenges? Well, uh, I'll share our, our process is very similar, but again, I'd highlight mm. you're just being more deliberate, right? Yeah. It's not like you're you're doing anything radically sort of new or different. You're saying, hey, we just have to ensure that the that this new employee meets the right people, has the right conversation, is supported. And we, we've come to a very similar conclusion where we just need to be much more deliberate about content that this person needs and sort of mentorship support um, mm-hmm. as they get integrated into that organization. And that's kind of always true. But again, in person, you can kind of catch it and solve for yeah. it without a formal process. Remote, you have to be more deliberate. Makes sense. Now, as we finish up, what do you see as the future of flexible work? given all of these dynamics? I mean, I think it's clearly here to stay. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think two things have surprised me. One is um, how how much sort of tech has flip-flopped, right? If you remember at first, the mania was all remote and now it's sort of all come back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that shows lack of uh, having thought things through. at the same time, what's also very clear is despite the wishes of some of the most powerful corporations on planet Earth, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, mm-hmm. their current policies are much more flexible than they would prefer, simply because clearly the talent has demanded it. And mm-hmm. this, these are the places with the strongest amenities, the strongest pull, the strongest reason to be in the office, and even those have had to settle for two or three days a week that is only inconsistently at best uh, sort of adhered to. (laughs) So I think that that showcases that the talent (laughs) clearly has a new expectation. And that expectation is for a fundamentally more flexible um, work environment. And I think for knowledge workers, obviously I won't apply to all the workers in the economy, but for the knowledge workers we're talking about, um, I think that's the new normal. And so the question is, who can meet that need the best? And you know, mm-hmm. one of the things we've seen is just an explosion in um, our job applicants, um, mm. and you know, not having any geographic restriction, and mm-hmm. sort of building up our focus as being a really deliberate and intentional virtual first employer um, mm-hmm. has given access us access to an incredible amount of talent, much more than ever before, which obviously is a huge asset to the business. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you, Marco. I really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Thank you. It's great to be here. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you check out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show.